Hi, my name is Jerry Croth, and I'm a professor in California. And this video is a knock your socks off kind of thing. It is, in my view, the most important discovery on the Kennedy assassination uh, in years, in decades. But I need to set this up. I need a few minutes of your time to lay this out for you. Okay, so let's get started. We're going to talk about one thing, the Oswald letter. Now, I wrote this book called The Kennedy Assassination, What It Really Happened. Subtitle, The Oswald Letter, JFK Archive Releases, uh, Trump Released Documents in 2017, 2018, Biden in 2021. Most are completely ridiculous, but I read them all. I spent the last five months reading 1,800 documents, okay? So this is a 2022 edition of this book. And the last thing is, in this book, it's a deathbed confession implicating President Johnson in the murder. That's the book. But we're going to talk about just one aspect of this here, and that is the Oswald letter. This is a letter allegedly, allegedly written by Lee Harvey Oswald on November 8, 1963. Now, that's 14 days before Kennedy was killed, and it's 16 days be before Oswald was murdered. All right? So that's the subject of today's talk. Now, <clears throat> what does it say? Here it is. Dear Mr. Hunt, he's writing to a guy named Mr. Hunt. I would like information concerning my position. I'm asking only for information. I'm suggesting that we discuss the matter fully before any steps are taken by me or anybody else. Thank you, Lee Harvey Oswald. Now pay attention to this misspelling because this is the Sherlock Holmes discovery of this talk. Okay, uh, but you've got to stay with me for the background because it makes no sense otherwise. All right, so first of all, when the government hears about this letter, man, this has got to be faked. This cannot stand because it means Oswald is involved with somebody. There's a conspiracy afoot, Mr. Hunt. It also means that something is going to happen that is being planned before actions are taken by me or anybody else. It also means that Oswald is in the dark. He doesn't know what's happening. I want more information. Somebody's setting him up. We got to stop this. This idea has to be put down. Okay, it's got to be censored. It's got to be explained away. It cannot stand. It's got to be refuted. Okay, this letter is dangerous. So is this talk, I think. So take a deep breath and let's begin with this. Where does this letter come from? So in 1977, a journalist named Penn Jones, he owns a newspaper in Texas, okay? Uh, he's a pretty reputable journalist. Uh, but he's taken a position that he doesn't think the Warren Commission is telling, telling the truth. So this letter comes to him anonymously from Mexico City. And copies of the letter go to two other people. Penn Jones takes the letter to the House Select Committee of uh, investigating the assassination, and they are very interested. They send it out for to handwriting experts, and two of the handwriting experts say, that's Oswald's handwriting. One says, I'm not so sure. Okay. So ultimately, this is how the threat was diffused. And almost everybody believes this, okay? Almost even on, in the conspiracy school, most everybody believes this. A few people don't. I don't. Here's the, here's the story, the once upon a time story of how we got rid of this letter. There's a guy named Vasily Matrokin. He is a KGB agent. He's not happy with Russia and the Soviet Union. He saves some documents and puts them under his floorboard in his dacha. And ultimately, he takes notes, too, and he takes all these papers and gets out of Russia. All right? He goes to the British embassy with all these papers, ultimately goes to Britain. This is what the FBI said. The FBI said the information was the most complete and extensive intelligence ever received from any source. 
The material became known as the Matrokin Archive. So, I mean, he's talking about India and China and spies and assassinations and almost the whole history of the KGB. All right, but in Britain, he works with a professor named Christopher Andrew, and they wrote a book. Their first book, I think, is called The Sword and the Shield, and there were other variations of that book, where all of this intelligence is described, okay? I've heard that Motrokin was not too happy with this arrangement. I don't know where I read that. But in this book, it says that that letter from Oswald to Hunt was fabricated by the KGB. The KGB took a CIA agent, Howard Hunt, and um, created this letter to implicate Oswald and the CIA. Okay? So they would deflect attention away from the Soviets. So that's how the letter originated. Most people believe that. Well, I was uh, interested in that misspelled word, concerting. So I wanted to check, and I looked at uh, Andrew's footnotes. And, I, and, and by the way, a lot of researchers, not a lot, but a few, say that the Matrokin Archive and the Andrew book is not accurate. It's sensationalistic. It's uh, It's been criticized by a few people. Well, I just wanted to know where Matrokin talked about this letter. So I wrote to Cambridge. So I wanted to know, did Matrokin actually say that? Okay. And was it really a KGB forgery or was it the real Oswald? Now, by the time I got on this, Matrokin was dead. So I wrote to Christopher Andrew and he uh, ultimately I went to the Cambridge archive where uh, this Matrokin material is stored. Now, remember, even Marina Oswald said that was her husband's handwriting. Okay, so how could it be a KGB forgery? Well, that's the issue. So I went to the Matrokin archive, and I said, do I have to go all the way to Cambridge? No. Uh, the librarian was very nice. And this is what the Matrokin archive looks like. It's all typewritten Russian. And I said, well, here's footnote number one, two, three, four, from Andrew's book and another book, and I got, these are all the materials. Could you send me this? She said, sure. So she sends me 32 pages of Russian from the Matrokin archive, okay? Now, I don't read Russian well. My wife is a Russian, her name is Anya. So I ask her, Anya, would you please go into your office and look through these 32 pages of Russian text. Look for the word Oswald, look for the word Hunt, look for a date, November 8th, 1963, look for the name Lee Harvey Oswald, and circle it, okay? So she goes very nicely into her office and comes back and says, sorry, there's nothing here. I said, that is weird. Uh, and I said, please, do it again. This is really important. Go back, do it again, make sure of yourself. She goes back into her office, leaps through 33 pages of Russian text, and comes back and says, there is nothing there. Oswald's name is never even mentioned. Okay, are you kidding me? So I double-checked the footnotes, I double-checked the references, I uh, wrote to Christopher Andrew and said, there's nothing in there. And uh, I got some kind of a reply from him, uh, but I, I thought maybe there was a mistake somewhere along the way. I wrote to him again. Finally, I said, listen, uh, Professor Andrew, I'm going to publish a book, and I'm going to say that there is nothing in those footnotes and the Matrokin archive to substantiate that. There's nothing there. And he didn't say yes, he didn't say no, he didn't deny it, he didn't refute it, didn't affirm it. So the conclusion is, there's no evidence that the KGB forged the Oswald letter. Okay? Now, I'm not indicting anybody. Who knows where those errors could have occurred? Maybe Matrokin was fibbing. I don't know. But uh, all I do know is that there is nothing there about the Oswald Hunt letter, okay? So now we're going to begin. Are you ready to have your mind blown? Because we've done our background work 
And I swear to God, when you hear this, you're going to say, holy cow. All right, watch. That's an example of your mind being blown in the next two and a half minutes. So this is the key that opens the door to the Kennedy assassination mystery. All right. Uh, look at the letter again and look carefully at this misspelling. He misspells the word concerning. He puts a D in there. Okay. Oswald was diagnosed as dyslexic. He spelled Moscow Macau. He spelled awkward situation, awkward situation. He spelled necessary neckery. He spelled opinions, opiums. He was dyslexic. Okay? So I was thinking along, before the Matrokin thing, I was always thinking about this. I said, what if that misspelling is a symptom of his dyslexia? What if he actually wrote the word concerning another time? I mean, that would make it, that would prove that this letter was written by Oswald. It's not fake. This is his dyslexia talking. You can fake his handwriting, but you're going to fake his dyslexia? So the objective was the misspelled word concerning. Did he ever write that again? And if he did, wouldn't that prove that this was really Oswald's letter? <clears throat> okay, so now I'm off to try to do that. Now, I have to tell you, I have a PhD, and I'm a Jungian psychologist, but when I first started my career, I was a learning disability school diagnostician. I was an expert in dyslexia and learning disorders and reading disorders. That's what my first job was, and I wrote a book. I was very proud of this book. A Program Primer in Learning Disabilities by Jerome A. Croft, the first book I ever published. Okay, so I have some knowledge about this subject matter. Now, where can I find Oswald's original writings? Well, that's the problem. Everybody who quoted Oswald's historic diary or this or that memo, or whatever he wrote, they corrected his spelling. They corrected his punctuation. I'm looking for his mistakes. Couldn't find it. Finally, I find a book by Diane Halloway called Autobiography of Lee Harvey Oswald, My Life in My Own Words. And she's aware he's dyslexic. And she captures all of his spelling mistakes. And I said, my God, this is what I'm looking for. Okay. All right, get ready. I'm living in Puerto Vallarta with my wife in the wintertime. We go there and we own a condo. And that's the beautiful city of Puerto Vallarta. We spend our winters there. Now, if you're a tourist, you go to the beach, you drink margaritas, you have nachos, you go swimming, go parasailing, and go home. But if you live there, it gets to be old to do that every single day. So uh, there's a very vibrant intellectual community down there with teaching yoga and meditation and a writer's group and a drama group and so forth. So I'm... Look at that beach. I go from right to left. I'm carrying my computer. I have downloaded Diane Halloway's book. I walk across that beach to my favorite Mexican indoor restaurant. I order Mexican eggs Mexicana and a cappuccino, and I sit down for this important moment. Okay? And I am about ready to search Diane Halloway's book for the term concerning. Did Oswald write that any other time? Okay, and then I'm saying to yourself, to myself, okay, are you ready for this, Jerry? Because if there's no concerning in this book, then that, that probably wasn't written by Oswald. But if you find that he wrote that word again, wow. So I type in the word concerning, Search for this word. And there it is. There it is. In 1961, two years earlier, Oswald writes a letter to the American Embassy. Look at the yellow highlighted word. He spelled it concerning in 1961. Okay? And I'm sitting there saying, Holy shit, holy shit, 
holy shit. And the people in the restaurant are saying, who, who is that gringo over there talking to himself? So I get my computer and I put it in the bag. I get up and I walk out of the restaurant. I forgot to even pay the bill. I got in trouble for not paying the bill. I, I don't walk home. I take a taxi home. I get home and I go back, leave my computer and go back on the beach, a different beach, much more deserted. And I'm saying to myself, what's it mean? What's it mean? What does this mean? What does this mean? And my hairs on my arm are sticking up. And there, I mean, my heart is beating. And I go for a three-mile walk. Okay. After those three miles, I think, figure out, here is what it means, Jerry. Okay. It means Oswald was involved with someone. It means that is a mistake a dyslexic makes. It was really his letter. It means that he was in the dark. He was saying, I don't know what's happening. I need more information. It means that he knew something was going to happen. Something actions being taken by himself or someone else. It means that the Warren Commission is fake news because the Warren Commission said Oswald acted alone. Okay, that's a fable. Okay, that's what it means. It's a lie. That was the most dramatic day. Well, that's one of the five most dramatic days of my adult life. Okay, so thank you for staying and having your mind blown. But now, if you stick with me to the end of this, you're going to say, uh, I really think this is the most important discovery about the Kennedy assassination. I predict 80% of you will say that. We'll see. Stick with me. So the next question is, who's Mr. Hunt? All right. Well, there are two Mr. Hunts that come up for discussion. One is Howard Hunt. He was a CIA agent at the time. He retired from the CIA about 1970. Howard Hunt was thought to be in Daly Plaza at the time of the assassination. So says one author. He worked with David Atlee Phillips, who's up to his neck in Kennedy assassination circumstantial evidence. Okay, And they were contemporaries. They knew each other and worked together. He worked with anti-Castro Cubans in New Orleans. Oswald was in New Orleans. He worked in the CIA station in Mexico City. Oswald allegedly was in Mexico City. I don't believe it, but he, they say he was. He worked with anti-Castro Cubans in Miami. Now, H.L. Hunt was an oil billionaire in Dallas, one of the richest men in the United States. He hated Kennedy's guts. And people have said that they suspect that he was involved in the assassination. So, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, who are we going to go with here? And nothing is easy in the Kennedy assassination. So let's talk about some problems. Here's some problems with Howard Hunt. First of all, he always denied that he was involved in anything connected to the assassination. Um, he said he wasn't in Daly Plaza, but one author named Weberman got a photograph and put a plastic overlay on his photograph, and it was like amazing that the connection. But uh, Hunt sued him and said that was defamation, and Weberman lost the case, and then it was overturned. So we don't know. Finally, he said, Hunt said this, I don't know if he believed it, because I actually thought maybe Hunt sent this letter because Hunt, remember, retired from the CIA, got involved with the Watergate burglary, got arrested, had to go to prison. He was mad that the government that he served all his life did not stand behind him, and he had to go to prison for the Watergate burglary. Did he leak this letter from Mexico City? I can't prove that, but it's not a bad idea. Anyway, he said in his book that he actually believed the Soviets were trying to set him up with this letter and point to the CIA's involvement in the Kennedy assassination. That's what he said he believed. Okay, let's talk about something more important. Hunt writes letters. He writes books. He, he actually wrote spy novels. And he's dying. His first wife died, and he married again. And then his son, from the first wife, comes to his deathbed and said, Dad, I know about your books. Would you please tell me the truth? 
what really happened, what really happened, okay? And so his father confides in him, and he writes down notes, and he records what his father said, okay? I'm going to play that excerpt from you, for you. The only person he ever told was his son. Information that I've been providing you, uh, and you alone, by the way, consists of what is important in the story is that we've backtracked the chain of command up uh, through uh, up through Cordmire and laying the uh, the uh, doings at the doorstep of LBJ. He, in my opinion, had a an almost maniacal urge to become president. He regarded uh, uh, JFK as a as he was, in fact, an obstacle to achieving that. So he basically uh, implicates President Johnson in the murder of John F. Kennedy. And the son is writing all this stuff down. He also mentions people in the CIA and in the military who are involved in this plot. Okay, but there uh, he doesn't tell his son what he did. Okay. He, his son said, well, what did you do? And the only thing he said was, I was a bench warmer. That is the only admission he made. So he told his son, listen, your mother died. I married this other woman, and I told her I had nothing to do with the Kennedy assassination. So I'm not going to go there, okay? I'm not going to tell you any of these things, okay? I don't want her to have to deal with letters and everything after my death. So he never told his son what he did. So my question is, did Howard Hunt mail that letter to, uh, uh, from, from Mexico City or not? Uh, did Howard Hunt know Lee Harvey Oswald? Did they work together? How do you establish this connection when you don't have any evidence? Well, let's, we'll come back to that. But let's go and talk about H.L. Hunt. Maybe he's the guy. Maybe he's the Hunt. Well, of those uh, 1,800 memos and a couple thousand before that, there's a memo from a guy named Rothermel. And that, if you read the memo and the discussion in the book, you really can't believe that H.L. Uh, Hunt was involved. Uh, there's too much evidence against that. I'm not going to go into there. It's too complicated. But take my word for it, the Rothermel memo in my book and that discussion will pretty much disabuse you of any thought that it was Howard. There's another thought, and that is <clears throat> a psychological thought. If you hate Kennedy and you're planning on killing Kennedy, don't take out an ad in the newspaper on the day that Kennedy is assassinated saying how much you hate him. That's not good criminal behavior. So John Kennedy wakes up in Fort Worth, He's going to be going to Dallas that day. When President Kennedy woke up that morning in Fort Worth, Texas, the Dallas Morning News was delivered with his coffee. He, his face turned grim, and he shook his head, commenting that it was unimaginable that a paper could do such a thing. He handed it to Jackie, saying, We're heading into nut country today, because the full-page ad said, Wanted for treason. Welcome, Mr. Kennedy, to Dallas. Sponsored by the American Fact-Finding Committee. Well, it turns out that Nelson Bunker Hunt, who was H.L. Hunt's son, uh, he was connected to that ad that said Kennedy was a pawn of the communists. All right? And the full-page ad about... Kennedy being wanted for treason was ultimately traced to financiers, one of whom was Nelson Bunker Hunt. Why would you kill the president and take out a full page ad on the same day? All right. Why in God's name would you do that? It makes no sense. I know there are professors and there are other researchers who still believe that it was Hunt, but I cannot get over those, those ideas. I cannot see him doing that. So my best guess is that Oswald was writing to Howard Hunt of the CIA. 
But there's one weak spot that I cannot, I'm, I want you to know, that I'm not selling a bill of goods. I, I think of myself as objective. So if there's a weak point to this theory, here it is. Howard Hunt used aliases. He used aliases when he dealt with anti-Castro Cubans. His favorite alias was Eduardo. Why wasn't he using an alias with Lee Harvey Oswald? Why was Lee Harvey Oswald writing to Hunt using his real name? I can't answer that question. Okay. So, uh, the, but I have two sources of evidence in favor of the fact that Oswald and Hunt knew each other. The first is that there are photographs of Howard Hunt in Daly Plaza that are really, really compelling. And even though he denied it, he said he was eating Chinese food in Virginia. Okay? But I have one eyewitness. Um, you may not like this eyewitness, but I have one eyewitness. It's two weeks old. I mean, I knew about this a couple of years ago, but I made sure of what I was going to tell you right now two weeks ago. So get ready. I have to introduce a very controversial figure, James Files. James Files... Uh, was in prison at the time I met him. He had been arrested for uh, a, a thing with a policeman. He was 21 years old, at the t about to, uh, 21 at the time of the Kennedy assassination. He'd been in the army, in the service. Uh, he knew about firearms. He knew about explosives. And I think he was wanting to be a, a mafiosi. So he was in Chicago, and Sam Giancana was kind of the head of the Chicago mob with a guy named Tony Accardo. Now, the head executioner for the Chicago mob was named Chucky Nicoletti. And James Files carried water for Chucky Nicoletti. He was his assistant. And the team goes to Dallas for the hit on Kennedy. That's all in the book, How the Mafia Got Involved in This. So I'm not going in there. That'll make this video too long. So James Files goes with Nicoletti to Dallas, and Nicoletti says, okay, you stand at the grassy knoll with your firearm, but don't shoot Kennedy. We're going to try to hit him from behind, because Oswald, we want to frame him. They didn't say that to Files. Files' instructions are, don't shoot Kennedy unless we missed. And if you don't see that he was hit, take your shot. Here comes James Files. And at that point, when they started proceeding down Elm Street, Shots started being fired from behind, and I assumed that it was Mr. Nicoletti because he was the one who was in the building, and I knew that Johnny Roselli was there. And uh, I remember the shots ringing out, and even though the president was being hit with the rounds, I was considering it a miss because I knew that we were going for a headshot on the president. And I had known he had been hit in the body, but I didn't know what part at that time. And I seen the body lurch, and I saw the body lurch again. I heard another shot that missed, and we were supposed to hit no one but Conley. I mean, no one but Mr. Kennedy. And I guess Governor Conley got hit with one of the rounds at that point. And I wasn't even sure that because I was keeping Kennedy as best I could in the scope on the fireball. And when I got to the point where I thought it would be the last field of fire, I had zeroed in to the left side of the head there that I had because if I waited any longer, then Jacqueline Kennedy would have been in the line of fire. And I'd been instructed for nothing to happen to her. And at that moment, I figured this is my last chance for a shot, and he still had not been hit in the head. So as I fired that round, Mr. Nicoletti and I had fired approximately at the same time as the hit started forward, then it went backward. And when I would have to say that his shell struck approximately one thousandth of a second ahead of mine, maybe, that's what started pushing the head forward, which caused me to miss in the left eye, and I came in on the left side of the temple. When he says the left side of the temple, he means the left from his perspective, because it was the right side of Kennedy's temple. Okay, so I want to tell you about my relationship with James Files. I write to him in prison. I've never met him. I've corresponded with him. I would write him a letter, because I saw a video of his, and I said, how does this guy know so much? He said, I don't read Kennedy books. I read fiction in, in prison. Apparently, they didn't have a lot of Kennedy conspiracy books in prison, but he knew everything. And I thought, well, I mean, uh, I, I asked him questions about obscure figures. Do you know Richard Kane? Yeah, yeah, Richard Kane was a, a policeman who went and worked for Giancana. And uh, then I made up some names. I tried to trick him because there are a lot of people who wrote and said, James Files is a liar. 
And he said he was here, he wasn't there. He said he did this, he didn't do that. And I'm confused uh, because what he's telling me is accurate, but what all these other people are telling him uh, about files is very damaging. One guy was a pretty well-respected conspiracy researcher named Epstein, I believe. He said uh, James Files wasn't even in Dallas. He was in Chicago uh, in a hospital because his daughter was being born and he was there attending to the birth of his daughter. I said in my letter, I said, well, what do you say about that? And Files said, yeah, I was in Chicago, but my daughter was born in 1966, not in 1963, pal. So I never caught uh, James Files in a lie. I even said, I, I read 20, 30 books on Kennedy easily. And so I said, okay, who was Sam Saya? Nobody knows who Sam Saya was. He said, oh, I never liked drug dealers. Right on the button. So I believe him. Now James Files gets out of prison and gets married. And he's living in Illinois. Now just think of it. Everybody's dead. JFK, RFK, Jackie Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy, all of the military people, all of the CIA people, all of the mafia people. But the man who killed John F. Kennedy is alive and well and living in Illinois with his wife and has written a book, or maybe two, on how he killed the president. I said either to him or to one of his friends, wasn't he afraid of getting arrested? He said, no, the government wouldn't touch him. They don't want to open up a can of worms. So, are you ready now for your second mind-blowing event? I checked this two weeks ago. Questions to James Files. Ready? Did Howard Hunt know Lee Harvey Oswald? Yes. Was Howard Hunt trying to set up Oswald? I don't know. Do you know what Howard Hunt was doing with Lee Harvey Oswald? No. Was Howard Hunt in Daly Plaza at the time of the assassination? Yes. Okay, there's my witness. <laughs> now, if they take this witness in a court of law, he's not going to do very well. He will be impugned upside down and sideways. But there's James Files with his wife, the man who killed John F. Kennedy, Merry Christmas, and um, strangely enough, I have to tell you, I believe him. Okay? Now, these. this is the book, and oh, we've only talked about the Oswald letter here, and there are lots of dots in this book that are connected. So, before we quit, I want to go back to Oswald's dyslexia, because this is the moment that you're going to say, I do believe this. I believe this is true. Okay? Watch. Oswald is diagnosed as dyslexic as a child. What do you know about dyslexia? Here's a word. Sesame Street. Same or different? Concerning, concerning. Concerning, concerning. Concerning, concerning. Can you hear the difference between those two words? Phonetically, they are very close. Okay? Which one is concerning? Which one is concerning? I'm concerned. It's concerning and it's concerning. People with dyslexia often have good auditory skills. Okay? They process language through their ears, not visually. This is a 30 second video on dyslexia and the visual issues that come with this disorder. Watch. Dyslexia, what does the text appear to look like? Here's an example of the text going three-dimensional. You know, it just doesn't stay still. Uh, it just sort of pulls away from the page a bit. Uh, it makes it a bit tiring to read and a bit tricky. Um, it certainly doesn't help your fluency, and I wouldn't want to be saying it like that. Here's text that's shattering or splitting apart, or it looks like a pane of glass is just sort of broken into pieces. Um, not a fun way of trying to read. Certainly, if... If your child has this, they're not motivated to read because, really, the words shouldn't be moving like that for them. And here's what happens when words are sort of disappearing from the page. Uh, different kids will have this to different extents, but you don't want this. This really slows down your fluency. It, it's also tiring. It's frustrating. Okay, so 
uh, when I did my work in learning handicaps, uh, there's a difference between reading comprehension and listening comprehension. If I say read this book, and you've got the, all these visual perceptual things happening, and then I ask you questions about what you read, you don't get the answers right very often. You do poorly in school, even though people with dyslexia have above average intelligence often. Uh, Oswald had above average intelligence. But you don't score high in reading comprehension. But if you listen and someone reads the story to you, okay, and you process language auditorially, and then I ask you questions, you get all those answers right. Okay? Oswald has excellent listening comprehension. Do you know that Oswald's Russian was impeccable? I don't know if he could read or to write it, but he listened and spoke Russian beautifully. One guy said Oswald's Russian was better than any undergraduate Russian language major he ever met. Okay, Oswald learned the language through his ears. Now, he actually did write the word concerning correctly, as well as incorrectly. You see at the top? He tried to correct his spelling. He knew he was a terrible speller. They didn't have spell checkers then. Okay, but his natural way was to spell a word the way he heard it. And he heard concerning. Okay, are you concerned about that? Don't you find that concerning? I'm concerned about that, and therefore I find that very concerning. Don't you find it concerning? Do you see this error is a perfectly good example of a logical phonetic mistake made by a dyslexic person? And that means that Oswald wrote the letter. They didn't fake his dyslexia. It's real. It's real. It's not a forgery. It's not a fake. It's not something that is made up. It was really written by Lee Harvey Oswald. And that means, my friends, that the Warren Commission that said Oswald acted alone is wrong. It is a lie. It is a fiction. And there's another word for that. Okay, so I want to nominate somebody for a Nobel Prize. That woman, I never met her. I don't know if she's alive or dead. Diane Holloway. I thought that took a little painstaking effort to capture every single one of Oswald's mistakes because one word changes the world. Okay, The word of concerting in his writings proves that that letter was written by Oswald. Okay. She deserves a Nobel Prize because we would have never figured it out without her and her co-author too. And by the way, I deserve honorable mention for being the Sherlock Holmes here. Okay, so that's the book and you can get it from Amazon. And I want to thank you for sticking this out with me. And I hope you think what I thought you would think. But listen, uh, there's a lot of censorship going on in our society now. I don't know how controversial this video is going to be. So pass the, spread the word and maybe download this because who knows, it could disappear in a second. And I think this is a very, very important discovery. So thanks a lot. See you guys around.